One of the big ideas of the Book of Obadiah that I neglected to mention before, and I, I think that it was a good idea that I didn't mention it before, but um, but a big idea of it is that you can't save everyone. You know, as Christians, we, we are called to love every, everyone, and, and as ministers and stuff, we try and tell people about Jesus. But the truth is, is that you can't save everyone. There, there will be people who don't accept the message. There will be people who... Um, no matter how much you work with them, they, they don't change. You don't allow God to God to change them. Very frequently in the church, um, we'll deal with people who um, call themselves Christians for years. They're just bitter and contentious people, and they just go around causing fights and causing problems. You deal with them, and you deal with them, and you're patient. You want to see them change. They don't. And then they leave the church disgruntled. It's something that you can't save everyone. And if you, uh, if you go to it with the idea that I can save everyone, you're just going to wear yourself out and get yourself really depressed because then when people – you know, don't change. It's just, it's just disastrous. And I think that it's important to remember a lot of what Paul said about this. Um, for instance, in Romans 16, 17, he says to stay away from contentious people, people who just start fights all the time, say snide comments all the time. You know, those kinds of they, they call themselves Christians, but just stay away from it. And if you, if you notice, he says this right after saying in Romans chapter 12, not to let your love be without, not to let your love be with hypocrisy. You know, so it's just a, a little contrast there between you know giving grace and with that being said doesn't mean that let me say it like this just because you do everything right doesn't mean that everything will go right mm -hmm. there's this idea that if if if, if somebody rejects the message it's, it's your fault you know you have to be a shining example all the time you have to do everything perfect all the time even if you do everything perfect all the time that doesn't guarantee that the results will be good I mean that's that's sad, but it is. And if you ever get involved in ministry in the future, guys, um, remember that that you know you can do the best you can do and whatnot, but ultimately you can't save everyone. Even if you do and say everything right, their their response is not guaranteed. If you love and genuinely care, that doesn't mean you can change them or save them. Obadiah didn't want this to happen when he's giving the giving the giving this prophecy. He stops himself multiple times, you know, to exclaim about, "Oh man, you guys are going to be completely ruined!" Just like these cries of despair. And so he didn't want these things to happen, but he didn't really have any say. And the people of Edom didn't repent either. And um, that's just a, a tragic thing, but it's nevertheless a part of. The prophet's journey. We read books of the prophets and whatnot, and, and we understand what they're saying and stuff, but one thing that we we don't get is what it was like to be them, to have the agony, you know, to, to know somebody's destruction is coming, to not enjoy it, and to know there's nothing you can do about it. And that, that struggle between maybe trying to blame God or blame yourself or blame them and just trying not to get a bad attitude and trying to do what God calls you to, you know, that's that's part of being a prophet that we overlook. Because we just read the words and we move on with our day. But you have to remember, for them, this is something much more heartfelt. Um, so we looked at the introduction last week. We looked at the judgment. We're going to do the last verse today, and we'll, then we'll move on to the third section, which is the charge. Once again, that's the big kind of weird part about Obadiah is that the charge comes after the judgment. Um, I uh, did it, had a court case last, uh, last week for something that we were going through. And, uh, you know, they don't... They don't bring the judgment first and then they bring the charges. People, judges don't do that. They go charges and then the judgment. <laughs> yeah. um, so we'll actually get into part of the bad good news tonight, and then next week we'll finish up the bad good news and then get into the good good news. Um, <laughs> and uh, so something that's interesting to mention now, you'll remember that I said that the name of God appears seven different times in this book, and it only has 21 verses. And two of those times that it appears is in the first verse. So... Is, you know, God's a, a big focus on all that. But here's the weird thing, guys. In the part that we're going to study tonight, the charge, God is never mentioned. So it's like he's bringing this charge, and it almost feels like a charge between two, two brothers having a conflict. You know what I mean? Almost like God's void of, of the whole argument. The only way that, that God is mentioned in this whole section is indirectly. One time it says... My people, God talking for being Israel, you know, and that's the only reference to God in the whole section. Um, and since since God appears so much in the other sections, that's kind of significant. So let's finish uh, finish up this this section here. <clears throat> 
I'll start in verse 1 since it's so, so short. The vision of Obadiah, this is what the Lord God says concerning Edom. We have heard a report from the Lord, and a messenger has been sent among the nations, saying, Arise, let's get up and go up against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You are greatly despised. The arrogance of your heart has deceived you. The one who lives in the clefts of the rock, on the height of his dwelling place, who says in his heart, Who will bring me down to earth? Excuse me. Though you make your home high like the eagle, though you, excuse me, Set your nest among the stars. From there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. If thieves came to you, if robbers by night, oh, how you will be ruined. Would they not steal only until they had enough? If great pickers came to you, would they not leave some gleanings? Oh, how Esau will be searched and his hidden treasures searched out. All the people allied with you will send you to the border. The people at peace with you will deceive you and overpower you. They who eat your bread will set an ambush for you. There is no understanding in him. Will I not on that day, declares the Lord, eliminate wise men from Edom and understanding from the mountains of Esau? Then your warriors will be filled with terror, Temin, so that everyone will be eliminated from the mountain of Esau by murder. So that takes us to verse 10, where we'll pick up tonight. Because of violence to your brother Jacob, shame will cover you and you will be eliminated forever. So this is why this is happening. Why is Esau being punished? What's the big thing? Well, if you remember in the book of Habakkuk, pride was a big thing, right? That was like one of the big reasons why punishment was coming. But here, it's not pride, but violence toward Israel. That, that's, that's a big thing. You, it, it, throughout the book of Obadiah, it's, it's contrasting this, this battle between brothers. Um, Esau has mistreated his brother Jacob, and um, it's just this, that that's the reason why God is bringing, um, bringing punishment. So here it says, because of violence to your brother Jacob, shame will cover you. Shame isn't necessarily in this context the idea of, oh, I'm so embarrassed. It's more of a loss of status. Um, uh, the nation is going to be destroyed. It's not going to have a prominent place among the nations, um, which is accurate. After this, they were destroyed, and, the, and Edom was never a nation again. I already explained to you guys last week about how Petra uh, was inhabited after this by the Nabataeans, and how Edom became no more than a province in Rome named Edomia, and... King Herod, that's right. King, yeah, King Herod was was part uh, Edomite, but uh, they never became a, a people again. Um, in fact, now that area, which was once controlled by Moab, Ammon, and Edom, is known today as Jordan, the, the nation of Jordan. Um, it's next to Israel, and um, yeah, it's on the other side of the Jordan River. Um, okay, so then that takes us to... Um, not not takes us to it's something else I wanted to mention. In verse two, he said, "Behold, I will make you small among the nations." Um, small among the nations is not about size; it's about importance. So it's not talking comparatively. You'll be smaller. Like here's your here's your landmass now, and it's going to be less than that. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, "I'll make you small, insignificant." Um, we don't really use this kind of. We don't really talk like this nowadays. But the idea is, I'll make you more of like imp impotent. I'll cut you off. And so when we say, I will make you small, you think of, I'm big, you're making me smaller. Well, that's not really the idea. It's more, I will make you obsolete. I will make you, I will reduce you. Your, import, your importance will be nothing. So a little bit different than we maybe think and talk today, but meh. I'm, it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. So then that takes us to verse 11, which starts us into the next section of Obadiah, the charge. On that day you stood aloof. On the day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gate and cast lots for Jerusalem, you too were as one of them. So here um, we get a little bit more of a picture of what's going on. Um, and if you, it, um, just to kind of back up before I go into verse 11, I forgot to mention this before. It says, because of violence done to your brother. So the word violence is kind of a catch-all term. Um, it, it can be um, violent action motivated by hatred and greed and lacking in any sympathy toward a victim. That would be a good way of saying it. Um, it's the word used for things like murder and rape, abuse, that kind of stuff. It's, it's um, violence not in the sense as we think, oh, well, that was kind of a little bit mean. Violence is, is more of a word that means, you know, um, well, like I said, violent action motivated by hatred and greed and lacking in any sympathy toward a victim. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a really good uh, definition there. Um, so now we can go on to verse 11, on the day that you stood aloof. Now, um, if you are familiar with the prophets, you'll know that one thing that they continually say is the day, right? The day of the Lord or the day of whatever, right? Um, so 
here, he, God is talking about the coming day of judgment for Esau, but he's referencing back to the day of judgment for um, Israel. So on on the day that you stood aloof, when Israel was being punished, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you two were one of them. And so he, he repeats that over and over again in verse 12. The day, on the day, on the day. Verse 13, on the day, on the day, on the day. This is uh, just a, a term that prophets used, um, a day of Israel or the day of the Lord. It's it's more of an event. It's not a, um, and I have this written down somewhere, it's not a 24-hour period. It's an event. The day of the Lord is, is an event. And for so the day of Israel or the day of Jacob or the day of the Lord for Israel was when Babylon came and destroyed Jerusalem. But the day of Esau was either, once again, depending on how you interpret this book, about to happen or just did happen. So one thing that's kind of a little bit misleading um, in our English translations is in verse 11 it says, On the day that you stood aloof. Now if you know what aloof means, it kind of means like, you know, standoffish, not really getting involved in that kind of thing. Uh, that's not really the idea of what's being portrayed here, um, although it could be interpreted that way still. So the question is what is really being said? Either he's saying they didn't care, they saw what was happening, and they just, eh, whatevs, or... Um, the other way that this can be um, interpreted is more of the sense of cheering somebody on. Um, so kind of like, yeah, you can do it, guys. Um, I, I prefer that interpretation because it seems to fit with the end of the verse. Look at this. On the day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gate and cast lots for Jerusalem, you too were as one of them. So um, it makes clear they're as one that they joined in or at least condoned it, at the very, very least. And if you read in Psalm 137.7, this is actually something that seems to, it seems to be exactly what the psalmist is saying. He says, remember, Lord, against the sons of Edom, which is what we're talking about now, the day of Jerusalem, those who said, lay it bare, lay it bare to its foundation. So right there, the psalmist is saying that Esau was cheering them on and saying, yeah, destroy it. Another translation says, raise it to the ground. So uh, Lamentations, the book of Lamentations, does give a little bit of a better picture of what was what it was like in Jerusalem when it was being conquered. Um, very obviously, it was somebody who was living through it. And Lamentations was not a second witness; it was like first eyewitness, um, or I should say, second source. So uh, one thing that's important, though, is to remember that is Jerusalem's destruction came gradually over several years and it took three actual defeats before the city was raised. So this is an ongoing event. This isn't something that happened on a day. It's something that was traumatic for a number of years and caused a lot of people to really question what's going on. You know, is, is God in control or is any, you know, just really big, hard questions that they're having a really hard time um, understanding. So it also seems possible that may, it's, that Edom escalated their behavior over the course of time. So like maybe at first they were like, oh, yeah, you guys are getting what you deserve. And then like after a couple of days, they're like, okay, we're going to get involved in this. And then after a couple of days, they're like, okay, Babylon, we're here to help you, man. We got your back. How can we help to destroy these people? Um, so then uh, here it says, on the day you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth. This is a little bit ambiguous. It could be translated in any of these ways. Money, possessions, or nobility. So I'll let you be the decider of that, but either way it all fits. They did come and take their nobility on the first or second um, time that they conquered the city. Um, they did carry off their possessions, and they did carry off their money. So it also might be um, – might be a somewhat vague reference to the Jerusalem. I mean, to Jerusalem as a whole in the temple on the day that they came and stole the, you know, stole the temple, temple when they destroyed it. You know, kind of the idea of that was their pride and joy. Um, so then, uh, let's see. It says here, uh, and foreigners entered his gate and cast lots for Jerusalem. There's a lot of different ideas of what this could be, and I'll read them off to you. Number one, um, this could be a reference to trading slaves. Um, you know kind of getting involved with the trade slave as they take over um, Jerusalem, partitioning off people to sell them. There is actually another prophet that mentions Esau getting involved with the slave trade, so that, that is possible. Um, it might also be a reference to segmenting the population, dividing them up and to decide who goes where. Um, it might be a reference to dividing the prophets of Jerusalem, not literally the city. Um, 
It might be a reference to dividing the city so as to either loot it or control it. So basically, okay, Commander uh, Nicole and Commander Gracie, you get this part of the city, you get this part of the city. You get the spoils in that part, you get the spoils in that part. Or, um, once again, uh, to, to divide the city to control it. So you decide what to do with the sums, You whatever you want. You do downtown whatever you want, okay? It's kind of like that. So it could be any of those, um, any of those translations. They all kind of fit. So... If you notice, though, the the real focus is on Esau, not even on the Babylonians. He could have used a lot of really strong words to talk about Babylon, but look at the words that he actually uses to talk about Babylon. Strangers. Hold on. Foreigners. See, he doesn't he doesn't say this, you know, those dirty dogs, dirty dogs. You know, <laughs> he, he he doesn't say that. He uses this just kind of a mild word. And uh, yeah, instead of because the the the, the idea here is really um, Esau is the one who 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 did the dirty, uh, for lack of a better word. Um, the the their wrath is for the one who should have known better, the brother. If you guys remember Lord of the Rings, there's a part where Treebeard says, "I wish I should know better." <laughs> Anyways, and uh, the the whole idea of Obadiah is that the, as a brother, Esau should have known better, and he didn't. Um, so uh, another thing I want to point out is that Babylon was the nation that was sent to punish Israel, not Edom. At the very least, they could have minded their own business. See, because God called Babylon to punish Israel. Edom went and stuck their finger in the pie, too. They had no business. <laughs> had nothing to do with them. So at the very least, they could have just you know butted out and minded their own business. They could have helped, but they weren't even expected to help. They were just expected to mind your own business while God's punishing those people, right? It's like this. If you see God's punishing someone and you try and stick your fingers in there and make it worse for them. Oh, I see that God's punishing you. <laughs> Let me just kind of poke you a little bit. <laughs> you deserve it anyways. Well, you could have minded your own business. You didn't have to go and intentionally hurt somebody who's already hurt, right? Um, and it, maybe maybe the argument could be said, well, if they fought for Israel, they would have just been destroyed, and uh, you know they would have been getting in, way, in the way of God's punishment. That's okay. I'll, I'll accept that. Maybe they shouldn't have fought for Israel, but they could they could have given Israel shelter. It says, and we're going to look at this in just a little bit, the way that Israel ran to them for help, and instead they set traps and sent them over to, back to their enemies. Well, they didn't have to do that. They didn't have to fight Babylon, but they didn't have to so willingly aid in the destruction of a people. So, oh, another thing I wanted to mention, Edom, it is possible. It is possible. Now, this is a huge asterisk, maybe. It is possible Edom may have kind of worshipped Yahweh as well as Israel. Um, either right about the same time as they were getting into the Promised Land or shortly thereafter, it's, it is possible. Um Although they did it their own way and they did it without the law. So let's keep that in perspective. If that is a thing, they could have been like, a, yeah, we were right. You were worshiping Yahweh the wrong way. We're still here. Yahweh obviously was okay with our way. You were just being an arrogant prick. You see what I mean? Like it, That might be the undertone of what's happening here. I'll let you guys draw your own conclusions on that. Um and also, uh, it's possible that Esau was pretty excited because this might have meant better trade and uh, pr and privileges for them. You know, they get more control over the trade routes because Israel's not there anymore. Um, so on the day you stood aloof, on the day the strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gate and cast lots to Jerusalem, you too were as one of them. Then we get to verse 12. Do not gloat over your brother's day, the day of his misfortune, and do not rejoice over the sons of Judah on the day of their destruction. Yes, do not boast on the day of their distress. Um, so here we have gloat is repeated twice in verse uh, 12 and then again in verse uh, 13. Um, to rejoice is mentioned in verse 12 and to boast. The idea being here, hey, they deserve it. Well, that'll show them, right? <laughs> they, they disobeyed God. They deserved it. Well, that'll show them how that they shouldn't have done that. Another thing that they might have thought is, ha, we win. We're the last man standing. Um, they might have thought we're better, and I already talked about that with how they might have been worshiping Yahweh as well at the same time. Um, Just in a different, in a different way. Right, and they definitely did have idols, so it wasn't in the way that Yahweh One. said. Right. So, um, And then they might have had the idea of, hey, it's better for us. So that's kind of the idea of, of what's being said when he says, don't gloat over your brother's day, rejoice over the sons of Judah, and uh, boast on the day of their distress. 
So then that takes us to here. It says here, um, do not gloat over your brother's day, the day of his misfortune or the day of his destruction. These are just synonyms for the same concept. The day of his misfortune, the day of their destruction, the day of their distress. It's the same day. It's just synonyms. Synonyms. It's a way of of um, of kind of saying something in a more elaborate way than just simply saying it. He could have just said, um, when Israel was being destroyed, you guys were kind of acting like jerks. God's gonna God's gonna cut you down for that. It just has no flair to it, guys. No flair. <laughs> um, and it's also a synonym the way he uses the way he uses this part here. Your brother's day, sons of Judah, um, their distress, uh, my people. These are all synonyms once again. So as you're reading through this, realize that he's not saying separate things and separate concepts and separate people. He's talking about the same things. He's just using synonyms. Um, and if you look here in verses 11 through 12, it seems the focus seems to be more on the attitude of Esau. You stood aloof, um, you too were as one of them, you were gloating, you were rejoicing, you were boasting. These are all kind of attitude things. Well, then we get into verse 13, and it goes more from passively watching to actively joining in. Um, it gets a little bit more intense. Do not enter the gate of my people, rather than just simply gloating and rejoicing. Now we're actually talking about entering the gate of my people. Um, and the idea here is that the the defenses have fallen. And but if you notice here, this is very significant. It, it might not seem significant just reading through it how we are, but for Israel, this would have been extremely um, extremely important. So God talks to you, right? He gives you a law. He says, "This is you're my people. I'm your God. This is the land that I am giving to you." Right? Well, then something happens, and Babylon comes by, and he, they just kind of poop all over your happiness, and everything kind of goes down down the toilet. So your your idea here is obviously, well, Yahweh has abandoned us, right? Well, what we see here is a little subtle promise to the people of Israel. Do not enter the gate of my people. God still very specifically calls them his own, even though the, the deal is um, – what's the term? Uh, uh, Cancelled out, the, to the, 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 con the covenant has been um, compromised, broken, whatever you want to say. There's still this this almost like a declaration of hope. So the covenant consisted of land, Yahweh, Israel. Well, they had just been kicked out of the land, and they weren't really a people anymore. So here, God is obviously still saying they were still his people. He did not abandon them. Even without the land or even without the son of David ruling, um, without, without any of that, um, he, they were still his people. So obviously a very strong uh, message of hope there. So here we have gloated again. The word means to either gaze intently or to gloat at. <laughs> I have it so much better than you, Nicole. <laughs> you know, gloating at somebody. Um, or to gaze intently, like, you know, watching somebody's destruction, gazing intently. Look at all the bad things that happens to them. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's, that's what the word means. You're gazing intently, gloating. Um, then here it says, uh, you indeed do not gloat over their catastrophe on the day of their disaster and do not lay a hand on their wealth. The, it means to, uh, to stretch your hand out. So we're talking about taking property, status, wealth, basically profiting. And obviously um, the argument could be made, well, why does it matter? They don't need it anymore. Well, God didn't see it like that. So then we get to verse 14. Do not stand at the crossroads to eliminate their survivors and do not hand over their refugees on the day of their distress. Now we get to the climax of Esau's charges, the things that they did that was – I mean the other things were bad, but this is like the icing on the cake. The, in fact, this is more than the icing. This is like three-fourths of the cake. This is, this is kind of a big deal. Um, so they were watching for survivors so as to attack them, kill them, and arrest them. Think about that, guys. There's, these are refugees. They've just lost everything. They're running for their lives. They've just seen their family and friends slaughtered. And they were sitting there waiting, waiting to catch them and to do one of the one of the following, to attack them, so to harm them, um, to kill them, or to arrest them and send them back to Babylon. Either way, they were literally standing guard so as to do harm to somebody else. Which I'm just thinking, man, kudos to you guys for being so driven. I, I don't have the attention span to sit there standing for good, let alone to sit there standing for – that's a joke. <laughs> 
So they are catching uh, those who were seeking refuge, people who were trying to find a place to be safe. Um, and uh, they were trying to escape from, from Babylon as a crushing force. And uh, they were turning them over, back over to Babylon. Um, so Esau set out to do harm to others intentionally. Well, that takes us to the, la to the next section, not the last section, the second to last section, the bad good news. Um, and that starts in verse 15 through 18. For the day of the Lord is near for all the nations. Just as you have done, it will also be done to you. Your dwelling will return on your own head. Um, let me, whoops, arm button, there we go. So here's, this is kind of interesting because the idea was kind of Esau was worse off. The other people are better. But here, for the day of the Lord is near uh, near for all the nations. The idea is that the other nations aren't safe. They're not better either. Their judgment was coming next. As it was done, it will be done to them. Um, kind of a, I guess you could say, a, a take on, uh, on what Jesus would later say about the golden rule. So as Babylon was a symbol of pride in the book of Habakkuk, Esau is a symbol of all the nations in Obadiah. If you remember when we were going through Habakkuk, um, it brought up Babylon, and they were the enemy, but then eventually the argument changed from Babylon versus Israel to the prideful versus those who live by faith, remember? And they contrasted the prideful to the righteous. Well, here that's exactly what's happening. It started out as a, as a tiff between Esau and Israel, and now it's kind of evolving into the way that Israel is punished for their evil, and the nations, Esau being the 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 model for the rest of the nations, is going to be, be punished. It's the same kind of concept happening. Um and here, uh, there's actually two different things being said here. It says, you, as you have done, it will be done to you. So people will done to you as you have done to them. But then the second time he says it a little bit differently. Your dealings will return on your own head. The idea is that the consequences of the actions will fall on them. So basically think of, I'm going to punch Nicole. But instead of her getting hurt in the face, it's going to hurt me in the face. The consequences of my actions is going to come back on me. See what I mean? That's kind of that's kind of the idea of what's being said there. So as I said, the day of the Lord is not actually a 24-hour literal day. It's an event. It's God's intervention in human history. Um, and so there was a lot of people at this time that thought, you know what, that's a long way off. That The, the day of the Lord is a long way off. We're still safe. Um, and uh, many actually said that if you read through the prophets, you'll see it. Another thing that I wanted to mention is that um, there's a, there's an idea kind of going around uh, among the Wiccans and, and, and uh, witches and that kind of stuff that actually um, might help you understand what's being said here. They believe that if you utter a curse to someone who doesn't deserve it, it will return on the person who spoke it. And that's the kind of the idea here. They're, they're, they're setting out to harm somebody else, but the effects of that harm are going to come back on them. Seven times over, I've heard. Wouldn't you – well, that's not what it says here, but, I mean, I wouldn't disagree with that. Um, wouldn't you love that to see all the people that, that you hate to, for all the times that they're trying to do you harm just to have them punch themselves in the face? <laughs> just kidding, guys. It's a joke. Um, so these sections had a lot of references to the, to the books of Ezekiel and Jeremiah specifically, uh, as well as Amos and a few others. I didn't include them, so it wouldn't be over long, but I just want you to know that this, this section is just packed with references with those other prophetic books. Um, once again, if you're wanting something like that, you just – excuse me, pick up a commentary about Obadiah, and you'll see just the, – they, they list all of them, and I, I just don't want to take up our time with it. Um, Obadiah, though, is, is a prophet who's very much rooted in the passages of the other prophets in the law. Obadiah is kind of like, I guess you'd say, a conglomeration of other prophets. Um, he wasn't really bringing anything new to the table in the sense of we've never heard this before, but he was very much so bringing something new to the table in that something that God was saying through other people was confirmed again through Obadiah. Um, so, okay. For just as you drink on my holy mountain, all the nations will drink continually. They will drink to the last drop and become as if they had never existed. So this is kind of interesting what's happening here. I already mentioned they started with Esau and expanded out to all the nations. You know, the punishment isn't just going to Esau, it's going to all the nations. Okay. But if you look here, he says very, very, very interesting. For just as you drink on my holy mountain. He has already said, my people, tying himself that he is still their God, and now he's tied himself again to Jerusalem, even though the temple was destroyed, even though his people no longer live there. He has again tied himself to it with my holy mountain. So this is kind of significant. Um, God still claimed the land as well. Uh, 
Mount Zion, my holy mountain, doesn't have to to just be the temple mount of Jerusalem, and it doesn't have to just be Jerusalem. It can also be the land of Israel as a whole. It can also be the coming heavenly city. It can also be the new earth. It has a lot of different implications. Um, and then as far as here, drink. This is a very common um, metaphor in the prophets. If you read through the prophets, to drink is basically um, – uh, it's basically the wrath, the wrath of God, right? So it can be talked about as though it was poison. So like you drink it and you, you know, uh, or it can be talked about as more of you drink the wrath on yourself uh, and are punished. Um, so then the question being, so who is the one drinking on the holy mountain? Well, obviously it seems like he's talking about Esau, right? For just as Esau drank on my holy mountain, but that doesn't really make sense. It, it could be in the way that Esau went there, and as they were gloating, they partook of the coming judgment by being on there when it was being destroyed so kind of like you were there i saw you it's like it's like who, everyone who opened the pharaoh's tomb right so they're all going to be whoever was at the pharaoh's tomb being opened is going to is maybe like that but it actually switches um person when it's talking you can't see it in english but it's there in the hebrew so it seems like what he's saying is actually this for just as israel you israel drank on my holy mountain you were punished in jerusalem all the nations will, will drink continually. They will drink to the last drop and become as if they had never existed. So if, if he's actually talking to Israel here, switching from talking to Esau to talking about Israel, then that would be give, give more credence to the idea that this was not necessarily a book given only or even at all to the nation of Esau, but it was given to Israel the whole time. Um, but we ta already talked about that a couple weeks ago. Um, so either way... Um, Israel had already drank of it, and so now the nations would, or Esau drank of it when they came to came to revel in, in Israel's failure, and so therefore um, the punishment was coming for, for a long time. Either way, however you want to look at it. Um, so, let's see. My pages are sticking together. Okay, there you go. Uh, ish. For just as you drink on my holy mountain, all the nations will drink continually. They will drink to the last drop and become as if they had never existed. You guys saw Ringo? Oh, yeah. yeah. As if they never existed. Uh, anyways, um, so that's the where we're going to stop now. You can kind of see how, it, how, the, how the tone of the book is changing, right? We were talking about Esau, all the bad things that Esau did. Then he switches over to... You know, now he's talking about the nations and and the judgment that's going to come on the nations, and it's like, oh, this just got this things just got like way more. Uh, eesh. So uh, you can see why that why um, I followed that outline that called this the bad good news. <laughs> I mean, it's good news for Israel, but it's real bad for others. <laughs>